This election cycle, there has been a lot of talk of going back to normal, but many of us fail to ask what going back to normal really means. This all began in 2016 when Donald Trump launched his presidential campaign in Trump Tower with his infamous statement about immigrants coming from Mexico. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. And some, I assume, are good people. This set the tone for his campaign and ultimately his presidency. Trump was showing the whole country that he wasn't going to be the decorum president that we're used to in this country. Out of the chaos of his campaign, he found a way to pull off a victory against Hillary Clinton, sparking a movement that we've never seen before. That movement is the hashtag resistance. Now, many people have very different descriptions of what that means, but it fueled the theme of the 2020 presidential race. Rather than focusing on policy in which past campaigns have, this election is about who can bring this country back to normal. But many who have set that standard have forgotten that normal is what gave rise to Donald Trump. So on today's podcast, we're going to discuss what gave rise to Donald Trump and what going back to normal will potentially mean for this country going forward. So we say, we always say the Black Panther Party, that they can do anything they want to do us. We might not be back. I might be in jail. I might be anywhere. But when I leave, you can remember I said, with the last words on my lips, that I am a revolutionary. Hey everyone, welcome to the All Wisconsin Revolution podcast. My name is Andre Walden and I'm joined with Will Walter. How you doing today, Will? Hey, I'm great, Andre. Uh, it's always good to be here. Always nice to talk about what's going on in the world, especially with the uh, events of 2020. You know, this has been crazy. It's crazy times. It's been an adjustment for all of us and that's putting it pretty mildly. Yeah, it's definitely been an emotional roller coaster. But today's thing, we really want to dig into... Um, this normal return back to normalcy theme. Uh, and this has been talked about in a lot of left wing circles that, oh, we just need to get back to normal. And you hear this in the debates, you hear this in, in MSN or MSNBC, all those type of circles. And what I really want to dig into is what does returning back to normal really mean? Because if you really look at it, normal was very status quo, so to speak. And what normal really brought us is NSA warrantless spying. It brought endless drone bombing, Syria, Libya. It brought the Flint water crisis. It brought the militarization of the police departments. Uh, I mean, normal necessarily isn't good. So in your minds, in, in, in your, in your mindset, what does normal returning back to normal mean to you or your interpretation of it? Um, in the sense of how people are speaking about it? Well, uh, personally, and, and I find myself saying this to a lot of, of liberals in particular who, like you said, they're just, oh, well, I want to go back to normal. Why can't we return to the status quo? I just, you know, I, I don't want to have to worry about going on Facebook at night and seeing what crazy thing our president said today. I just want to know that, that they're at least sane and stable as if, you know, a, a president doing and saying wild, crazy things is, is somehow the worst issue that America has, completely ignoring some of the systemic problems that, that we're facing and, and some of the long lasting issues that really have never been solved. Uh, you, you know, you mentioned the Flint water crisis, you mentioned the militarization of police, you mentioned NSA and, and their warrantless spying. America is far from perfect. And we still have a lot of issues that if this quote unquote normal uh, returns under Joe Biden, but none of these systemic issues are corrected, we're just setting the stage for another right wing populist to come in and, and win in 2024 or 2028. And this one will likely be competent. So, you know, imagine how much trouble Donald Trump has caused. He's at least an entertaining human being. And he's so incompetent that we can laugh at what he does and says and w w without kind of, how do I word this? So I think a lot of the extreme evil that Donald Trump would like to accomplish, he can't really do because he doesn't understand, like you said, decorum. He doesn't understand 
politics as as a means of getting what you want even though it's not good for others and if a right-wing populist comes along like a Tom Cotton or a Tucker Carlson or somebody who knows how to manipulate the system but isn't a complete clown they I mean they really could cause insurmountable damage for America and and the world and when you consider how serious climate change is already coming at us you know we might not have time right now to even handle any of any of the uh, climate situation that we're facing and if we find ourselves with a worse right-wing fascist in the near future it's it's probably gg for the human race you know society as we know it will will not uh will not have very much of an opportunity to continue on now that might not necessarily be a bad thing i guess uh like you said society's not doing so hot right now for the ultra rich there's been no better time to be alive and compared to you know the 400s the 1300s the 1600s uh, uh quality of life even for the impoverished today is significantly better than quality of life for the impoverished would have been 500 800 1000 years ago but i was under the impersonation that the benefit to a society advancing technologically you know developing ai and machinery to help do the jobs of human beings was to make human life better for everyone you don't have to spend all day working because we have the technology that can handle some of this work for you and though we've reached that that time frame because we're funneling all of the uh value the surplus value from our labor into the top 1%, we haven't been able to do that. So if we want to return to quote unquote normal, that's not good enough. That has never been good enough. And I think a lot of liberals fail to understand that. If you're talking to someone from, uh, you know, the minority communities or extremely impoverished neighborhoods and say like, oh, don't worry, Joe Biden's gonna gonna stop tweeting mean things at night. He's still going to give massive tax breaks to the rich. Um, he's still not going to implement a single-payer medical system. Uh, he's still going to throw people in prison for minor drug offenses. How is that any different for them? The people whose lives are really affected by, uh, by some of these corporatist policies that we've seen in the last 40, 50, 60 years, it doesn't really matter which party is in control if the party is still catering to the ultra rich those at the bottom of society will suffer so status quo is not good enough and a return to that will do nothing but set the stage for an even worse donald trump to come back in the near future and this one if they're competent and not a complete dumpster fire of a human being will likely end human life as we know it exactly and i think that's very true and i think a lot of these people who are in the the left wing circles who are pro return back to normalcy are really ignoring the fact that these normal so called policies and we're gonna use normal and status quo interchangeably uh policies is what radicalized people to want to vote for Donald Trump because if we really think about it, yeah, we had you know low unemployment, the stock market was doing pretty good under Obama but a lot of people stopped looking for work because there wasn't good paying jobs and and the jobs that you could get were the gig economy jobs you were doing uber uh you were probably getting part-time work in which part-time work you're not getting health care and you probably got to work two or three jobs just to get by and that radicalized people on the economic side of, of of the part and it's really easy to understand why somebody would throw a political cocktail at the system i.e. Donald Trump and say, hey, nothing's working for me and I need something to change. And Donald Trump came in and said, hey, I'm going to bring manufacturing back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring jobs back. I'm going to drain so the swamp. One can under yeah, drain the swamp. He was saying something different. So one can understand why someone would vote for somebody like Donald Trump. But we've seen already right now, and it's setting it up because we've just seen the debate between Kamala Harris and, and, and um in Pence and they're already setting the stage 
to ignore the neoliberal policies that got us to this place in the first place. Uh, uh, Lawrence O'Donnell, he compared Donald Trump to Mike Pence is the, the prince of gentility, whatever that means. Um, Rachel Maddow, she said it was, it was like a visit to normal po- politics land. They're already setting it up to ignore the heinous crimes that most of these neoliberals and neoconservatives crimes make just because they are they're fiending for the return to somebody who doesn't go on Twitter rants and who doesn't say nasty words in public. And and it's very dangerous what they're setting up because this is going to fuel endless wars. We were just talking about this, how uh, kids are old enough to serve in the same war that their fathers fought in. Uh, it's going to fuel the ongoing issue with climate fracking and Joe Biden has already said he's not going to ban fracking um, and, and the economy um, under Obama. We seen that wages were flat. There was no increase in wages. And we're going to see the same thing under Joe Biden because he says he's for $15 minimum wage, but he doesn't talk about it, which makes me think he's really not. So I think we're in this 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 situation where. People are so tired of the boogeyman in the White House that they're willing to settle for literally nothing and go back to the same policies that's going to give us another Donald Trump, like what you just stated. So I think it's it's this whole uh, circle going around where everybody's telling each other the same thing. And it's and they're convinced that, hey, that's what really what people really want. They don't care about policy. They don't care about their economic well-being they just want a president who can speak well well i mean we we already have <laughs> we we've witnessed firsthand that concept in action with the image rehabilitation of famous war criminal george w bush Full it's files. really worth watching and that, uh, republican or democrat alike uh, should watch that and what a beautiful closing line we rise or fall together, mm. and we choose to rise. It's just beautiful. Good morning, and welcome to Morning Joe. It is Monday, May 4th. With a lot of people said that they, they miss having a president like that, whether wow. it's a Democratic president or a Republican just miss president. Having someone with confidence. Someone that actually works to unite Americans. In a sane country where, you know, uh, tribalistic policy and, and identity being not... You know, if people didn't look, if people were capable of looking past party and looking towards policy, someone like George W. Bush would have been the end of the Republican Party. His presidency was a disaster on multiple fronts. Uh, You could argue that he's caused more damage to the world than Donald Trump did by his complete destabilization of the Middle East. And he's now almost like a cult hero to some of these wealthy television liberals. Oh, man, you know. George W. Bush, the good old days, and, you know, they show him painting with his little paintings, and, and he's with Ellen DeGeneres at, at baseball games and stuff. I mean, come on. <laughs> if this is going to be Donald Trump in five to ten years, which we know it will be based on uh, Rachel Maddow's statement on uh, Trump's coronavirus infection, they, it's it's more, they're not even trying to hide that uh the class warfare that that is really behind this struggle. The wealthy, rich elites are all on the same team, even if they aren't in the same political party. Um, Their disdain for the working class is is so obvious. And if we are going to sit here and act like it's okay to normalize the behavior of George W. Bush, then how can we not expect them to do the same with Donald Trump? Joe Biden... We have he has a record forty years long. We know what he is about. We know what he believes in. We know what he supports. To to sit here and act like he's this progressive unity champion that's going to bring America back together is almost as naive as it is depressing. So really, it it is a it is a really rough situation, and I think a lot of the people remember that. The three or four biggest media companies are all owned by some of the largest, most successful uh, companies on the planet. ABC is owned by Disney. Uh, CBS owned by Viacom. Uh, obviously, Fox Fox is uh, a media conglomerate all around the, uh, the planet under Rupert Murdoch. So these networks have a vested interest in keeping the status quo for a number of reasons. A, they benefit from it. 
they're the wealthy top of society, and B, they're all used as tools of division to keep the working class fighting each other amongst political lines and, in a lot of cases, you know, racial lines or uh, sexual orientation lines or, you know, I, I don't think a lot of people... Racism, you are not born a racist. It, it's taught to you. It's it's something you learn, something you pick up. And I think by these networks pushing hate on those that are different, whether it be different from race, sexual orientation, gender, ethnicity, uh, na- uh, national origin, if they can keep us divided amongst those lines instead of the only real line that matters, which is uh, wealth, uh, what class are you in, then they can continue to uh, enforce their will on, on society as a whole. And that's incredibly dangerous when you look at the state of the planet. We only have so many resources. This is not a video game where you can just keep on expanding and keep mining and keep doing yada, yada, yada forever as the uh, game procedurally generates more resources to disperse with people. There's a very finite level of resources on the planet. And when the top 1% and 0.1% are hoarding so incredibly many of them, the bottom 99.99% are going to begin to suffer, and at some point they're going to have had enough. You can only poke a sleeping bear so many times before it wakes up. I don't think they understand that, and or they do understand that perfectly and aren't concerned because they don't think we'll ever unite to actually do anything about it. I don't know what what the answer to that scenario would be, but either way, if nothing changes, we are looking at a climate catastrophe. We are looking at we're we're looking at the end of of human life. And I guess the argument could be made that that's a good thing for the rest of of living species. You know, if, if you're going to take the argument that humanity itself is the virus, our greed, our corruption. Uh, our need for more and more and more, our inability to be satisfied. We're wiping out uh, species left and right as we destroy their habitat, we destroy their food sources. We kind of are a plague on the world. So there's, there's, I find myself a lot of times lately, you know, you're watching a James Bond movie or or, an old cartoon show or whatever where there's some cartoonishly evil supervillain who has this crazy end goal about doing yada, yada, yada. Like, (laughs) I I find myself agreeing with them conceptually that the world would be better off without human life, which is too bad because there are some really great human beings out there who really care about life outside of themselves, both in terms of other species and other people, but we're not the ones that have any power. You need to be a ruthless, aggressive narcissistic ass to get to the top of human society today because society values money over anything else and unless that changes i don't i don't really see a future for us yeah i think you you made a good point there and i think that's a a really huge reason why a lot of us sympathize with the villain because even though you don't want mass genocide you kind of like well we are kind of causing our own uh, our own fate at this point. So you, you're like, oh man, this dude's horrible. But I mean, you're kind of you kind of right at the end of the day. But I think that brings us another point, um, which you which you talked about, and you talked about how the elites own all the media, media, and Fox News, MSNBC, all these places are under a few different conglomerate corporations, and it's really fueling the way people think, and that really goes into manu- manufacturing consent. And that's why you have this endless tug of war cycle in which the right is always going to say, hey, liberals just want to tax you to death and they don't want you to have freedom. They want to take your guns away. And then on the on the left, uh, they 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 want to, you know, take your right to choose. They want to um, have guns in schools, whatever everybody says. But this this endless division is over cultural issues for the most part. And we're we're fighting over cultural issues while they're running out the back with the with the money and the power. And and we're falling into the trap because our media that we well, I don't consume it very much, but most people consume. Um, they're they're only talking about those core issues and not talking about class division, as you've said. 
And I think that's why people are yarning for this so-called status quo is because they don't think about the economic issues of people. I mean, most Americans don't even understand that other countries don't have to pay for an ambulance ride. You know, most most people in America don't understand that they don't have co-pays in other countries. And we're, we're living in this continuous bubble of, oh, this is just how things work. And this is how the world works. No, it, it's not. But we yet somehow to... America is the greatest country in the world, you know, right? <laughs> we don't have any of these things that other first world nations are able to enjoy, but we're somehow still the best country in the planet. It's brainwashing, but it's it's so incredibly effective. Americans love to to giggle and laugh at North Korean media, but I would argue that American media is significantly worse uh, in oh, terms definitely. of they're much more effective. They're much more efficient, you know? Yeah, exactly. They are. And I think if you look at, I think there's been polls or scientific readings that shown that corporate media is actually worse than state media <laughs> because it's, it's really an endless cycle. Cause if you look at it, those same corporations, right. Who own these conglomerate media corporations, they donate to the politicians. So essentially they own the politicians. So it's not necessarily the, the, um, the poly- the government owning the media it's the media owning our government so essentially it's not state media that's needs to be run it's 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 the government that's been captured by the corporations so that's what's where the, the where the proper or the power really lies and i think that's why we have this situation where the corporatization of media is is really playing into the hands of of the thinking of people because most people don't hear what we're talking about. Most people don't think about what we're talking about because they don't hear it on, on their local news network or they don't hear it on their, their, their national news network. And we've been conditioned to, you know, you wake up in the morning, you turn on the TV, you listen to the morning news, you go to work, you're listening to the the news radio on the way to work. You get home, you turn on the nightly news it's it's the American way, you know, and the powers that be kind of understand that. So they have gone out of their way to control every step along that supply chain, thus ensuring that you're only receiving the information that they want you to receive. It, it goes it takes me back to that that meme where it's, um you know, the ultra rich dude sitting in the middle and he's got like 50 cookies on his plate. And then there's the white guy on the left and the black guy on the right. And um the the white guy only has one or two cookies and then the rich guy is like whispering into his ear like hey the black guy wants to take your cookie even though the black guy doesn't have any cookies and that you know you could replace that with with uh any race or any ethnicity or any any of the division lines that we've been discussing outside of class warfare and that meme would still be applicable the rich have so damn much but because they're able to convince the middle class and the lower class and everybody that's not them, basically, that the other classes besides the rich are the ones that are stealing from them. One of the greatest cons that they've pulled off is somehow convincing the middle class that the poor people on food stamps are the ones that that are stealing from them, that are taking advantage of the system, even though they're using, you know, well, let's let's look at the uh, unemployment benefits for during the uh, corona crisis, $600 additionally a week for unemployed people. That's what's eating the system, not Jeff Bezos' net, well, uh, net worth going up $100 billion in six months. No, 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 that's fine. That's not a big deal. It's the poor, it's the mother of four who can't afford to feed her children and who's on food stamps and needed the additional $600 uh, weekly benefits. She's the one that's that's mooching off of it. Not Donald Trump, who we know literally does not pay taxes, He's paid $750 in a good year, and he's not the one taking advantage of the system with his multi-million dollar uh, golf outings every weekend to his own private properties. No, 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 that's cool. It's, It's so obvious that the rich are doing this. I can't understand why more people are incapable of seeing it. Martin Luther King said... What God, 40, 60 years ago now at this point. I, I keep thinking it's the 2010s, man. This 2020 thing. Um, 
Uh, in America is all about socialism for the rich, rugged individualism for the poor. And we still see that every single day with with the corporate bailouts that w- that have been uh, getting passed out left and right in the greatest pandemic of the last hundred years, while small businesses are going are going under everywhere. The PPP loans, so many small businesses were unable to even get a dime of it because the uh, you know the friends of the system or people who weren't really a small business but were able to manipulate it a little bit to consider themselves drained the entire account before most small businesses had even slight access to it and for a party that likes to preach about how hard work and you know small businesses are the backbone of our economy to just throw 500 billion dollar unchecked slush fund at at the biggest corporations it's disgusting it's it's grotesque it's well i want to i want to point out something that you said though you said that people don't see that these billionaires or these people who have all the power have have captured it and they're the true issue i think conceptually people do understand it but they they're they're outrageous to the wrong it's in the wrong direction i suppose for example republicans they have the same outrage but they they address it to soros elitist, george soros yeah george soros <laughs> and an elite new york and california people right and leftists do it as well, and they they address it because oh the Republican Party is just corrupt, and they're the 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 party of corporate corporations. But what people aren't seeing is that it's both parties, and if we came together and fought both parties and called out those huge wealthy mega donors like Jeff Bezos and uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the then Cole we'll actually have some change. And, and people yeah. like that, yeah. But it, it, we're in this continuous fight where one side is thinking it's the other. Well, it's just the Democrats or it's just the Republicans. And then we're letting the 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 people with the real money and power run out the back door. And it's and it's working. And, and, the, and I always say the the greatest the greatest con job of all time was the the U.S. Civil War, where they got poor white people to fight for the slaves of rich white people. And and that's continuously the the game plan that has been used today. Oh, we still see that today. I mean, that's that's the American military. <laughs> yeah, exactly, it's the same playbook. It's just a different time. Rich white people that that understand that uh, poor children have that have no other options coming out of high school. That's why the military so uh, recruits so heavily in uh, minority and poor communities because a lot of these kids they don't have an opportunity to go to college otherwise they can't afford it their parents can't afford to send them to college so they have the military hey that's this great chance all you got to do is come spend a couple years in the middle east and we're going to mess around and we're going to hang out in the barracks you know and we're going to help some people and then you come home and you'll get free college they make it sound like it's this dream but it's you know it's not <laughs> you're being you're just a tool of continued oppression going to kind of enforce the will of the of the wealthy Americans upon other impoverished people in at least right now, the middle East will be my example because that's kind of the zone that we've decided that we American imperialism is going to start taking over, you know, all that, all that delicious oil and whatnot. What about people who say you're only interested in the middle East for oil? What? Huh? Oil? Who said some of my oil, bitch? You cooking? But um, it's it's a tale as old as time, like you said. The wealthy that don't want to fight, but they want resources, they want financial gain, they they need something, and they don't have the bodies to do it, so they just use their wealth, uh, dangle it in front of the uh, impoverished people, and then send them off to do it, which is another reason why they don't really want uh, income equality, because their money allows them to do and say whatever they want without repercussions. Uh, A great example would be somebody like Michael Bloomberg, who is so incredibly wealthy, he could never spend that much money if he wants to. But because money has been uh, determined by the Supreme Court to equate to free speech, he uses his free speech money to donate to political campaigns all across the country of both Democrats and Republicans. That way, no matter who wins, they're beholden to him because he gave them a whole boatload of money. And 
he's just the obvious example of that because of you know he was a famously a Republican governor and now he just ran as a as a the presidential nominee for the Democratic Party so he's not even trying to hide that he really doesn't care he just cares about enforcing his will that's kind of what all of of the the billionaires with their fingers dangling involved in all of this I mean Bill Gates said 25 years ago when somebody I, I might have the time frame wrong but he was asked, why don't you run for office? And he basically laughed and was like, why would I do that? I have so much more power now <laughs> because money is power. He can use his money to push forward any agenda that he wants. And if you throw enough money at it, people will listen because they need the money because as a society, we're desperate for more money. So if, if we start taking this money away from the rich and redistributing it, now these poor people who would have been so desperate for money, uh, you know, they, they can't afford to do anything else, so they have to suck it up and basically be the slaves of the wealthy, get shipped off to the Middle East to go kill, uh, you know, poor brown children or whatever that the U.S. apparently needs billion, hundreds of billions of dollars for each year when we can't afford to take care of our own citizens. These poor people are no longer going to have to do that. They have money themselves. They have other options. So it would destabilize all of the objective goals of the ultra wealthy if they didn't have this literal army of slave of basically slaves that will do whatever they want because they have no other options they are so desperate for money it it's slavery without the legality of it and i am not equating that you know to it's not literally as brutal as as american slavery but it it well i shouldn't even say american slavery there are there is still slavery in, on the planet it it's not like slavery of the of the past in America where you are quite literally owned by an individual they've just done a better job of hiding it behind uh the influence of of money upon society itself if that makes sense yeah that makes sense but i think how we really break down this 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 endless cycle is we have to eventually destroy the two-party system because as long as the two-party system is allowed to continue uh we'll have a system where it's a division based on left and right and if we can break down the two-party system more people will be involved in the political system because their ideas are probably going to be addressed and 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 their values and their ideologies but not only that, but we also have to destroy our current campaign finance system, which allows these billionaires to own our government and capture our government through political donations, through lobbying, through um, even these think tanks that literally write the policy for most of these politicians. Mm -hmm. We have to completely break down the established order in order to fix this system. And it's going to take a mass mobilization and a mass movement to do that. And I'm not sure if people have the will to do that, but I think it's imperative that we do if we want to save this country, because at this point we are declining on the verge of failed state. People are literally, um, I mean, look at how we're addressing the COVID crisis in other countries. They're getting $1,200 or, or $2,000 payments because they can't work right now. Here we get one $1,200 check and we're told to figure it out. And, and it's just showing the decline of the state and we have to do extreme changes to fix the system. And I'm not saying that we have to destroy everything. We don't have to have a violent revolution, but we do have to shut down the economic process that allows this, this uh, blatant corruption to exist because as long as we keep working in their fast food restaurants we keep taking out their garbage we keep attending to their rich powerful needs of of attending their yachts and attending their big lavish houses and cutting their grasses they have no incentive to shut down the established order and we have to we have to deprogram ourselves from the current way of thinking it's kind of remarkable. They've done such a great job of keeping Americans just comfortable enough where we where we don't want to revolt, but miserable enough where we understand that this entire situation is incredibly messed up. Uh, exactly. I mean, you you look at protesting in the past. Obviously, COVID has changed this quite a bit, but most people couldn't really afford, even if they were incredibly passionate about something, you can't just take a day off of work to go protest. You're going to get fired. And if you get fired, you lose your health care. 
you lose your health care, you get sick one time, you're bankrupt, you lose your house, you lose your house, now you, you, know, you have nothing left. And they kind of use that as, as a threat hanging over our heads, the slippery slope of you need to continue doing my bidding or else the situation will only get worse. So those who recognize that they're kind of comfortable aren't willing to change. And I think this comes back, uh, that was a great job of circling back to our status quo conversation. I think that's why a lot of people yearn for the status quo is because they recognize that it could get worse, but they benefit from the system as it is currently designed. They might not be the ultra rich, but they're comfortable. They have all their needs taken care of. They don't have to worry about where their next meal is going to be. They can afford to go for a, you know, a decent vacation once a year or whatever. They are more than happy with that because they recognize how much worse it could be and they don't want to jeopardize their current moderate comfortability by standing up for the marginalized communities who can't enjoy those same opportunities. And I think that's, um, that kind of goes back to, to MLK again when he said the white moderate is, is worse than the oppressor because they recognize something is wrong. They just don't want to do anything about it. Uh, I, I understand the self-preservation uh, mindset that, that that might bring, you know, maybe you are quote unquote upper middle class. You recognize that the system benefits you in a lot of ways and you think it's bullshit and you think it's incredibly unfair and you think it's, it's disgusting that, uh, that so many people are, are being taken advantage of, but you don't want to be the one taken advantage of. So you kind of shut up and play by the rules. That's, that's the the reality of the situation, I think, for a lot of people who, who might otherwise want to do something about it. And that's why you hear a lot of the uh, liberals in particular, well, just vote. You can change the system by voting. You can change the system by voting. Well, there's an argument to be made that if voting actually was capable of changing the system, we wouldn't be allowed to do it. Uh, that's something I hear from a lot of leftists, that Voting is just kind of giving us the illusion of, of controlling our own destiny. Well, in reality, the, the, the strings are still being pulled by the, by the same people. And I think that's a great um, comparison to the, to the two-party system that you can, you, know, you can vote for either party and both parties are super different, but in the end, they're controlled by the same people. It's like uh, the old Henry Ford statement where he said, uh, what did he say? You can have a Model T in any color you want as long as it's black. And that's exactly. kind of similar to, to what we see with American politics today, except we have two options instead of just one. You know, there there's 50 brands of uh, brands of cereal at the grocery store. You, you're walking around, you're like, oh man, I have so many awesome choices to choose from. Well, all 50 of those brands are owned by two companies, so it doesn't really matter which which cereal you, you buy. The same person's getting the money. It, it's just the, the illusion of choice, which makes us feel like we're free, but in reality... America is far from the freest nation on the planet. And like you said, it's going to take a mass mobilization of, of the working class for, for that to change. And I, I want to, to believe it's possible because I know there are so many people out there that genuinely believe in, in, in a just, equitable society for everyone. But the rich and powerful just have so much complete control over everything that it's going to be difficult. It's going to take a lot of work and... I'm I'm worried that if if that doesn't get started ASAP, we are going to run out of time. Yeah, I think we all fear that um, it, it's going to take a movement of class consciousness. Um, but I'm not sure if that's going to happen. But I know there's a lot of people out there still fighting. We just have to be optimistic about it. All right. Thank you guys for joining the Our Wisconsin Revolution podcast, and we will catch you guys later. Have a good one, everybody. Stay safe and healthy. So we say, we always say to Black Panther Party that they can do anything they want to do. We might not be back. I might be in jail. I might be anywhere. But when I leave, you can remember I said with the last words on my lips that I am a revolutionary.